Hello friends, uh, in this course on radiative heat transfer, uh, we have almost reached to the end of the course. We have been discussing the applications of radiative heat transfer. In last two lectures, we discussed the application of radiative transfer to combustion problems to flames, how the flame temperature is decided based on the interaction of radiation with the flame. We discussed about the effect of turbulence radiation interaction and many other effects of radiation on the flame temperature as well as the structure. In this lecture, we will study an application which is very important from energy point of view and that is uh, solar energy. We will discuss atmospheric and solar radiation in this lecture. We will highlight the importance of solar radiation into various bands how the solar radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere, how the aerosols and different gases they absorb radiation and what is the overall effect of these effects on energy production by solar photovoltaic cell or solar thermal cells. So, first of all we will uh, go into the uh, basics of uh, solar radiation. Solar radiation and uh, we also have uh, what we called uh, extraterrestrial radiation. So, it is basically composed of uh, a number of uh, wavelength regions starting from gamma rays, x rays, we have ultraviolet, thermal radiation, infrared and microwave radiation. So, according to the wavelength or frequency of the radiation, we can divide the spectrum into a number of regions. Most of the solar energy is basically centered around visible and short infrared uh, region and some energy is located in thermal infrared, but most of the energy in uh, solar uh, from sun is limited to these spectral range, the ultraviolet, visible, thermal infrared and far infrared. Now, we, uh, we will see that uh, from energy point of view thermal radiation uh, that is in this wavelength range is of uh, very significance. We have microwave which is very important in remote sensing. So, different uh, wavelength regions in solar spectrum uh, they have their own importance and according to this uh, they are classified into different regions. We will see how these regions are affected by the atmosphere. Now, there is some nomenclature that is popularly used in uh, atmospheric radiation. The radiation uh, all the radiation the wavelength intervals are basically represented here in this table in micron micrometer. So, the wavelength region from 0.1 micron to 4 micron is basically called short wave radiation. Now, this short wave radiation basically comprises of ultraviolet, it comprises of visible and it also comprises of near infrared. So, this 0.1 to 4 micron wavelength region is called short wave region. Now, 4 to 100 micron region is called long wave or far infrared region. Now, going into the further uh, uh, division of the spectral region 0 0.1 to 0 0.38. So, this is 0 0.38, 0 0.1 to 0 0.38 is uh, a spectral region which is called ultraviolet. We have near ultraviolet region, we have far infrared, uh, far ultraviolet region. So, ultraviolet means with wavelength less than violet. So, we know in the visible region, so normally the radiation is basically uh, the visible spectrum is taken as a reference. So, the highest frequency or the minimum wavelength in visible region is violet and highest wavelength and minimum frequency is basically the red. So, we basically designate the solar spectrum in terms of violet and red. So, ultraviolet is basically the wavelength which is less than the violet and we have three divisions in ultraviolet also UVA, UVB and UVC. So, three different spectral regions are basically designated for ultraviolet uh, spectrum. Then we have 0.38 to 0.75 is the visible part. Now, visible part starts from violet, the minimum wavelength is violet and then it goes all the way up to red. Red is the highest wavelength in visible. From red we have infrared, infrared means what comes after red. So, infrared will be 
the spectrum having wavelength greater than the wavelength of the red region of the visible spectrum. So, 0 0.75 to 4 is basically called near infrared region all the spectrum after red is basically infrared, but the infrared is also divided into near and far. So, near infrared is 0 0.75 to 4 micron and 4 to 1000 is basically designated as thermal infrared and in remote sensing this spectrum is also divided into two parts thermal infrared 1 and thermal infrared 2. After 1000 the spectral region is basically the microwave region where many remote sensing applications they are run and beyond 10 to the power 6 micron is the radio wave. So, this is how we can classify different uh, spectral regions of the solar spectrum, but the energy distribution of sun is mostly centered around visible and infrared. So, if you look at the content how much energy is cont uh, uh, stored in which part of the spectrum. So, we see that 7 percent of the solar energy is basically in the ultraviolet region, 43 percent is basically is in the visible region and nearly 37 percent in infrared near infrared and 11 percent in far infrared. So, total basically it becomes 48 percent. So, 48 percent is in the infrared region near and far infrared region and 7 percent is in the ultraviolet region. So, ultraviolet region although the energy content is very small only 7 percent, but, but because the wavelength is short the photons are very energetic this leads to serious health effects and we have uh, there have been studies that link this ultraviolet radiation to skin cancers as well as sunburn. So, ultraviolet radiation is very harmful and uh, the major gas that absorbs ultraviolet radiation in our atmosphere is ozone and uh, we have been listening uh, uh, that many gases many greenhouse gases uh, they also basically affect the ozone layer and due to depletion of ozone layer there is an increased ultraviolet radiation that is reaching the earth and this is leading to serious health benefits uh, health uh, uh, concerns. So, ultraviolet radiation uh, is very serious although the energy content is just 7 percent and 43 percent is the visible uh, radiation uh, starting from violet, blue, green, yellow and up to red. So, this is the visible uh, part of the spectrum and entire ultraviolet visible and near infrared is called short wave radiation. Now, we see that uh, how the solar radiation basically reaches earth on top of the earth's atmosphere. So, basically when we look at the radiation coming from sun, the radiation from the sun we assume that the sun behaves like a black body, the temperature of the sun is around 5700 Kelvin, 5700 to 5800 Kelvin that is the temperature of the sun surface and at that temperature sun behaves just like a black body and this intensity emitted by sun is also black body intensity given by the Planck function. If we integrate this intensity we get sigma t power 4 that is emissive power of the sun is equal to sigma t to the power 4 where sigma is the Boltzmann Stephen Boltzmann constant. Now, this radiation emitted from the sun it reaches the outer atmosphere of the earth without any change in intensity. So, the intensity is not affected when the radiation leaves the earth's uh, sun surface and when it reaches earth's outer atmosphere the radiation intensity is not affected because there is no medium in between. However, once it enters the earth's atmosphere it is subjected to absorption, scattering and many other phenomena because of the presence of gases and particles in earth's atmosphere. So, let us look at how the integrated intensity that is the emissive power looks like in the outer uh, outer uh, earth's atmosphere. So, this is the variation of extraterrestrial. So, extraterrestrial means outside the earth's territory, outside the earth, earth's atmosphere and this is called solar constant that means total energy received from the sun. So, this is integrated over all the wavelengths and we have what we call the solar constant. It varies from season to season this particular figure is uh, for the southern hemisphere this is for a location in south hemisphere uh, 
south hemisphere means not we are talking about the atmosphere, but this point is basically located in a region which is away from the sun. So, we know the sun's uh, earth's axis is tilted. So, some points will be near to the sun and some points will be away from the sun. Those points which are near to the sun, they will have summer and they will see higher solar constant in the summer. So, what I mean here is that this radiation constant is plotted for a point which is seeing summer in the month of January. In our country, uh, we see uh, low solar constant in January, but this is for a location which basically uh, sees higher solar constant in January. So, the solar constant goes uh, 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 the highest value in January near January and then it goes to a low value in June and then again it rises. So, there is a continuous variation of solar constant that means the amount of radiation received in the outer uh, in the outer atmosphere that is extraterrestrial radiation it goes from the highest value of around 1420 1415 to a lower value of 1320 so there is roughly a difference of 100 watt per meter square and this difference of 100 watt meter per meter square basically gives you the variation in temperature that we see in summers and winters. So, just a 10 uh, just a difference of 100 watt per meter square makes a difference in seasons in summer and winter temperatures. Now, how the spectrum looks like how the variation looks like when this same radiation enters the atmosphere and this uh, figure uh, of irradiation at any point on the surface of the earth we have seen it earlier also. So, we have three different curves here one is basically the black body intensity, the second one is extraterrestrial radiation and third one is basically the terrestrial radiation that is radiation received at the earth surface. So, black body radiation is smooth function given by Planck function at a temperature of 5780 Kelvin at which we assume that sun is a black body at a temperature of around 5780 Kelvin. And we have a solar constant average solar constant we have seen that solar constant varies from season to season from winter to summer but an average value is uh, 1366 watt per meter square and if you look at the extraterrestrial radiation top of the atmospheric radiation it pretty much is equivalent to the black body intensity function that means it's not a perfect black body function but the solar spectrum behaves very much like a black body and the agreement is relatively good. Okay. So, we see that this curve top of the atmosphere radiation matches pretty well with the solar spectrum the black body function and that is why the sun is assumed to behave like a black body. However, when we go to a point in the atmosphere we see that the radiation this curve is very much affected by the absorption and scattering by the gases the main gases that basically affect are water vapor and carbon dioxide, but there are other gases like ozone, chlorofluorocarbons, methane, N2O and other gases. So, the gas the these gases basically significantly affect the intensity of radiation. So, radiation coming from the sun is subjected to absorption by atmospheric gases and also by clouds and aerosol particles and what we see is there is a continuous uh, absorption and absorption is more in certain bands while absorption is less outside these bands. So, un, in certain bands the gases absorb significant amount of solar radiation. So, at the earth surface we see lot of reduction. So, we do not get 1366 watt per meter square this 1366 watt per meter square we get on top of the atmosphere if we are outside the earth atmosphere. But at the earth surface this radiation is subjected to its absorption and scattering and we get significantly less than this value. So, how basically uh, these uh, values are affected the first one is basically the average values the second one we have is basically the influence of cloud in clear conditions and cloudy conditions. So, let me just uh, first tell you how the clouds basically affect if there is no cloud then um, almost 70 percent of the radiation will reach earth surface. So, if there is no cloud only the water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will absorb solar radiation. So, there will be still some reduction 
and the values will be roughly 70 percent reaching the earth surface, 50 percent will be direct radiation and 15 percent will be diffuse radiation. What is direct and diffuse radiation we will discuss in, uh, in the coming slide. So, total amount of energy received at the earth surface is basically 70 percent if there is a clear sky condition and this value is going to be much less if there is a if there are clouds. So, under clear conditions only 30 percent 13 percent of energy is basically reflected and this reflection may be due to the presence of gases, water, aerosols, carbon dioxide. So, the gases are not very good reflected but still 13 percent of this energy is reflected back. If there are clouds then we see that only 25 percent energy is basically reaching earth surface. So, there is a significant reduction in amount of solar energy reaching earth surface because large amount of energy is reflected or absorbed by clouds and we see that there is a 4 percent only direct radiation. So, direct radiation is significantly reduced 55 percent in clear conditions to 4 percent only in direct conditions. So, direct component of the solar radiation is affected much while the diffuse component has increased. What happens when there is a cloud, the clouds scatter radiation and the diffuse component is basically the scattered component. So, let us say we are standing here on a surface the direct component and this is sun. So, direct component is the radiation coming directly from sun while the diffuse component. So, this is direct and the diffuse component is coming from the sky from all directions this is diffuse. So, this may be coming from the scattering. So, some radiation may have scattered here and then after multiple scattering the radiation may reach earth surface this is called diffuse radiation. Diffuse radiation means that radiation is reaching earth surface after undergoing multiple scattering in the atmosphere. So, we see that the scattering because in the presence of cloud the scattering might increase. So, we see an increase in diffuse component, but there is a significant reduction in the direct component of solar radiation due to the presence of clouds. The average effect is basically 30 percent of the energy is reflected by clouds, atmosphere, atmospheric gases and the surface. 25 percent of the energy is absorbed by the atmosphere. So, roughly 55 percent of the energy of the sun is lost in the atmosphere either due to absorption or due to reflection and some energy is basically reaching 45 percent of the energy. So, half of the energy is basically reaching the earth surface. So, this is an average value. It includes the days where clouds are there, it also includes the days where clouds are not there. So, on an, on an average 45 percent of the energy is basically reaching the earth surface either ocean or land surface. Now, how the transmission uh, of solar radiation is basically being affected. So, let us look at a closer view of that. So, radiation reaches on top of the atmosphere, the intensity is not affected, the intensity is same as it was at the surface of the sun. Now, once it starts entering the earth's atmosphere, it undergoes a scattering. On top of the atmosphere, intensity is not affected, but as it enters the atmosphere, it undergoes a scattering. And we have seen in a, uh, one of the previous lectures on particles, it is the blue light that scatters the most because of the my scattering which is inversely proportional to wavelength. We have seen in earlier lecture that the blue light scatters the most and by the time radiation reaches earth surface most of the blue light has been scattered out and only radiation that we reaches directly the earth surface may be just red. So, the sky color is blue because most of the blue radiation from the sun has been scattered out during in the atmosphere due to multiple scattering. So, we have only the red beam. So, whatever we are getting directly from the sun may contain only the red part of the radiation and that is basically the reason why we see sky to be red during evenings and in the early morning hours because in the early evening uh, uh, in the early morning and evening hours radiation penetrates at a deeper angle most of the blue radiation and other radiation components have been scattered out only the red component is remain uh, remaining in the earth uh, solar uh, solar radiation and that radiation uh, the red part of the spectrum of the sun reaches directly to us and we see that the sky appears red during sunset and sunrise so there are various bands uh, that affect solar radiation uh, i have listed here some of the important visible and infrared bands here so, we have uh, 
uh, these are basically bands in near infrared and far infrared. So, most of the gases that basically scatter and absorb radiation are basically water vapor and carbon dioxide and some amount of ozone. Ozone does not, uh, we have already seen that the solar energy is very less in ultraviolet, but still it is very harmful. So, ozone is important gas in the atmosphere because it filters out harmful ultraviolet radiation. There are many bands. So, what I have listed here in the second column is basically the band center. While discussing the radiative properties of gases, we discussed that molecular gases have what we call rho vibrational bands. So, molecular gases have rho vibrational bands and they have branches of P, Q and R branches. Some some gases they do not have Q branch, the Q branch may be missing. For example, ozone does not have a Q branch, H2O also does not have a Q branch. So, we have already studied this, what are the rho vibrational bands, what are the P branch, Q branch and R branch. So, water vapor has a strong band. So, there are many bands, what I have listed here is uh, the strongest bands. So, 6.3 micron, so there is a strong band. So, water, vap uh, water vapor absorbs strong solar radiation in 6.3 micron band. CO2 has uh, many bands in 4.3, 9.4, 10.4, 15. So, these are four bands uh, in which in near infrared, we also have bands in uh, ozone. So, 9.01, 9.59, 14.2. So, so, all these are important bands. They absorb significant amount of solar radiation. Uh, ag again, we have uh, in ultraviolet and uh, visible. This is uh, the uh, bottom uh, table is for the ultraviolet and visible. We have many bands in water vapor and we are we, there are many bands in carbon dioxide and ozone. So, when we are discussing radiative transfer, if we have to find out radiative transfer in atmosphere, we have to take into account absorption by these gases, all these gases and all these bands. So, we see that the analysis of or solving a radiative transfer equation through an atmosphere is not an easy task because we have to account for absorption across multiple spectral bands. So, there are bands uh, which absorb significant amount of solar radiation, but there are windows also uh, through which solar radiation is penetrated and it does not get absorbed in the atmosphere. So, window here spectral window means wavelength regions where solar radiation is not absorbed and there are specifically two windows in the atmosphere. The first window is visible window through which most of the uh, visible radiation is basically coming to our uh, surface. So, 4.4 to 0.7 micron that is the region where we have visible part of the visible uh, solar radiation and in this range 0.4 to 0.7 micron we have a window, very less amount of energy is absorbed and most of the radiation basically reaches earth surface. If this in window is closed and how can this window be closed? This window gets closed when there are clouds. So, clouds absorb significant amount of visible radiation. We have seen when there are clouds, there is a poor visibility. Sometimes the clouds may be black and we get uh, complete dark in even in the days. Then again uh, aerosols may be there, we have also seen that there when there are significant dust in the atmosphere, lot of visible radiation is absorbed and we have poor visibility. So, cloud cover and aerosols can close this window, although this closing may not be permanent, but sometimes they, this uh, uh, could be permanent also. Uh, there are number of studies which have identified as brown haze cloud over the Bengal uh, uh, sea. So, this pollution may lead, leads to uh, some permanent feature in the formation of aerosols at in certain lo uh, locations. What these uh, window uh, closing basically imply on our atmosphere? When the window is closed, definitely the visible radiation is absorbed in the uh, uh, clouds and aerosols and we get less amount of radiation and we get a cooling effect. So, if lot of dust is deposited in our atmosphere, the temperature of the uh, earth will basically decrease. So, it will have a cooling effect. The other window is long wave window in 8 to 12 micron region. Now, 8 to 12 micron region, this spectral region is important because earth emits radiation in this wavelength region. So, earth is also, you can approximate earth also like a black body, but at a much low temperature. So, temperature of the earth will be very low, around 300 Kelvin. So, the temperature of the earth will be very low, the average temperature of earth will be very low, but still you can approximate it like a black body. 
the most of the radiation emitted from the sun is uh, from the earth is in the 8 to 12 micron region and uh, if this window is there then this radiation basically escapes from the atmosphere and it is it is uh, basically vented out into the atmosphere. So, this is a way of cooling the earth surface we get lot of radiation in summers from the sun and in the night this radiation basically is emitted out into the atmosphere. If this window is closed what will happen? We will have what we call greenhouse effect. If this window is closed then the emission from the earth basically is reflected back or it is trapped in the atmosphere. It is not allowed to basically vented out in the uh, extraterrestrial region. And what can basically close this window? The greenhouse gases like CO2, methane and water vapor also. So, these gases basically when deposited in the atmosphere they absorb significant amount of radiation emitted from the earth and this leads to what we call greenhouse effect and it, the consequence is warming of the sun uh, from the, for, of the earth. And this is what we are seeing today. We are seeing lot of pollutants for lot of greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere which leads to what we call warming of the sun also called global warming. Other than gases we have aerosols. Now, what are aerosols? Aerosols are solid or liquid particles suspended in air. They are very fine particles. The diameter of these particles may be 0 0.002 micron to 100 micron. Some particles may be small, some particle may be large. It depends where these particles are coming from. S these particles may come from ocean. They, these particles may come uh, with desert dust. So, we have to basically look for the source. If we want to characterize the aerosols, we have to look for their source. What is the production mechanism? Is it a dust storm or uh, in monsoon we have lot of uh, moisture that comes from the uh, uh, oceans. We also have to look for size, the composition, shape, chemical composition, the dust of the Rajasthan may have different composition. Sometimes we get dust from the desert of Iran also. So, these uh, different type of aerosols may come in our atmosphere from far regions also. So, we have to look for the shape, size, chemical composition, amount and the distribution if you want to understand how these particles, how these aerosols are affecting our atmosphere. So, we have two types of uh, aerosol, uh, primary aerosol and secondary aerosol. Primary aerosols are basically the particles that are directly inject injected into the atmosphere such as sea salt, soot, pollutants and dust. These are primary aerosols. Then we have secondary aerosols which are not injected into the atmosphere rather they are synthesized or they basically form in the atmosphere itself. These are like sulphates and nitrates. So, we inject lot of gases like sulphur dioxide, nitric oxide into the atmosphere and these gases basically react with other gases and uh, they form what we call salts like sulphates and nitrates in the atmosphere itself. So, aerosols play an important role in deciding the temperature, in deciding the amount of radiation that is reaching the earth surface. So, in this picture uh, taken from the satellite what you see is basically the aerosol cloud over uh, the regions of uh, Punjab and Haryana. Uh, we have what we call aerosol cloud here. Uh, uh, it seems the origin of this uh, cloud, aerosol cloud is not uh, over Rajasthan, Rajasthan is here. It seems this is coming from Iran. Uh, so, we see that uh, these aerosol clouds can come from far distance also. Uh, now, in the picture on the red, uh, right side you see uh, basically uh, haze, uh, again this is uh, aerosols only over the gangetic uh, plains of uh, Uttar Pradesh. So, you see that there is lot of haze uh, or aerosols uh, and these aerosol clouds will certainly affect the solar radiation in a big way. So, after gases in the atmosphere, after clouds, uh, 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 after gases and aerosols, the major component in the atmosphere that affects solar radiation is clouds. And clouds can be of different types depending on the altitude. So, at different altitudes we have different type of clouds. The clouds have different uh, characteristic, some are made uh, of uh, fine liquid water, some may have even ice crystals. So, different type of clouds exist and they absorb radiation in different bands. So, understanding these type of clouds again it is a very complex task. Uh, here we will not try to uh, solve uh, how the clouds basically absorb solar radiation. But what are the major parameters that uh, govern uh, solar radiation and cloud interaction? is type of clouds, there may be different type of clouds, 
the coverage of the clouds whether it is a continuous cloud or a broken cloud then what is the liquid water content in the cloud normally it ranges from 0 0.05 to 3 gram per meter cube so we have to talk uh, about uh, the liquid water content what is the size of the droplets in the cloud it ranges from 10 per centimeter cube to uh, 1000 per centimeter cube. So, how much droplets are present in the cloud that decides how thick or how thin the cloud is and based on this thickness it will absorb solar radiation. Then droplet size also is an important parameter. It ranges from few micron to 100 of micron. The average diameter of the droplets will be around 20 to 20, but some droplets may be very small and these droplets will definitely uh, uh, go under my scattering and some droplets may be large. So, clouds uh, uh, in itself is a complicated uh, phenomena that affects solar radiation uh, and it is a major factor in uh, uh, attenuation of solar radiation and many models have been developed to classify the clouds. Now, how these clouds, these gases and aerosols affect solar radiation at the ground. So, uh, so we just take extra terrestrial radiation is 1366 7 uh, watt per meter square we discussed this uh, in the previous slide. So, around 1367 watt per meter square is the extraterrestrial radiation reaching outer atmosphere and when it penetrates through earth atmosphere there may be cloud there may not be cloud. If there is no cloud then we see that on a clear day on a cloudless day we reach we get 100 and uh, sorry 1050 watt per meter square DNI and 1120 GHI. So, on a clear day also there is a significant reduction around 30 percent reduction in radiation reaching earth surface on a clear sky day and when there is a clear sky day this may be further reduced by 50 percent. So, uh, the radiation value will significantly decrease. So, other than these gases, clouds and aerosols there is a natural uh, uh, dependence of at atmosphere that affects radiation. The main is the diurnal variation, diurnal variation is basically the change in radiation value from morning to the evening. So, we see that the radiation reaches maximum in the noon and then it decreases in the evening and it rises in the morning. So, this is called diurnal variation and why it basically varies uh, with time because the change in zenith angle. So, the zenith angle basically we will discuss uh, uh, in the next slides. Uh, zenith angle basically decides the direction of sun with respect to a location. So, sun is directly overhead at noon while it is at an angle uh, when it is uh, before noon or after noon it is at an angle and the amount of radiation received from sun will be less than its value at the noon. So, that is called diurnal variation. Then there is air mass when the sun is uh, directly above us it has to travel a short path. So, that path is basically called AM1. Okay, air mass 1 that means what is air mass? Air mass is basically defined as amount of atmosphere the solar radiation has to penetrate through. If we are at top of the atmosphere the solar radiation does not has to penet penetrate through any atmosphere we call it AM0. So, extraterrestrial radiation is called basically AM0 or air mass 0 that is top of the atmosphere radiation. Air mass 1 is basically radiation when sun is directly overhead and the path is shortest. When we have any other angle, any other zenith angle, we may have different uh, air mass. Of this air mass 1.5 is very important in solar radiation studies, air mass 1.5 is very important and it is at a zenith angle of 48.2 degree. Uh, this has been uh, uh, taken importance in many solar radiation application because at many mid latitudes we have air mass 1.5 and for air solar radiation studies air mass 1.5 is very important. So, air mass is an important parameter that affects solar radiation and many solar projects are basically designed by taking air mass 1.5 into account and uh, this is a very important parameter. Now, let us uh, go into the details of solar radiation how uh, the solar energy is, con con is contributed to power. There are two components of solar energy that basically we receive at the earth surface the direct component. So, we have sun and we have a surface. So, there is a direct component this direct component definitely change with the inclination of sun it depends on zenith angle and then there is a diffuse component basically radiation coming from all the direction that is diffuse 
there is not much effect of diffused radiation uh, uh, by these anth angle. So, direct solar radiation, direct normal irradiance is called basically the beam radiation and it is basically specified on a plane surface normal to the sun. So, we see that normal to the sun it will depends on the inclination of the sun and it is measured by a device called pyroheliometer. Then there is a diffuse component DHI which basically is a result of scattering by the constituents of the atmosphere like clouds, gases, aerosols. So, all these components of the atmosphere they scatter radiation and this scattered radiation basically reaches at the earth surface from all directions. We call it basically the direct horizontal irradiance. Then we combine the DNI and DHI, so total component reaching the earth surface has contribution from direct component as well as the diffuse component and the total component is called global horizontal irradiance. It is basically total hemispherical downwelling solar radiation on horizontal surface. So, if you have a horizontal surface, what is the total amount of radiation reaching on this directly as well as through diffuse means and we write GHI as equal to DHI plus DNI cos theta where theta is the zenith angle. So, theta is the angle which basically that gives you how the sun is oriented with respect to this earth surface and this is measured by a device called pyranometer. So, we have uh, solar zenith angle depends on three important parameters. So, solar zenith angle basically gives you an idea of how the sun is oriented with respect to a particular location. So, this location will vary from latitude to latitude. So, the first parameter that decides the zenith angle is the latitude. At higher latitude we have uh, higher inclination, on the equator we have least inclination. So, we get more solar energy at the equator and less energy at the poles. The second angle is the solar inclination angle. It varies from season to season, we have seen this. So, this will affect radiation in the extraterrestrial atmosphere also. We get more radiation in summers in our uh, country and we get less radiation in winters. So, that basically depends on the season to season and it depends on local time also. So, we get more radiation at the noon and uh, less radiation in the evening and the morning hours. So, the relation between solar zenith angle theta and latitude angle phi and inclination angle delta and local time h is given by this relation cos theta is equal to sin phi sin delta cos phi plus cos phi cos delta cos h. Okay. Now, if we look at the amount of radiation let us say in New Delhi which has latitude 28.6 north at noon that means h is equal to 0. If you look at the radiation values or the zenith angle values, uh, the delta is 84 degree in June roughly an idea. The inclination angle of earth is 84 degree in uh, the month of June and delta is 38 degree in December. So, we get zenith angle of 61.5 degree in New Delhi in June and we get a in, uh, zenith angle of 72.85 degree in December. So, this is for New Delhi in June and December at a time 12 in the noon. So, 12 noon at this point this is going to be the zenith angle and by this zenith angle you can calculate the values of GHI using this relation. So, let us just uh, look at the data. This data is taken from uh, MNRE uh, Ministry of Non-Renewable Energy. So, what this data basically shows you is the uh, monthly averaged or oh sorry monthly integrated values of GHI in uh, the units of mega joule. So, this is give you the mega joule uh, of energy total amount of solar energy received on a surface uh, located all over India. In the month of January we have a very less amount of radiation ok. The maximum radiation is in the south India uh, which is reaching around 20 uh, mega joule. Now, as we go towards March, uh, the summers are basically uh, uh, closing in and we see that there is a significant amount of uh, radiation increase and uh, this almost reaches to 24 mega joule uh, in 
the most of uh, most uh, uh, parts of the western and southern uh, southern india while still we have uh, less amount of radiation but the radiation in the northern part also has increased significantly in the month of march now going towards uh, the may in the may uh, the monsoon activity starts uh, 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 on the coast of uh, uh, the Kerala. So, we see that uh, the radiation values have started decreasing uh, because of the monsoon activity because a lot of clouds uh, uh, forming in and a lot of moisture coming in uh, 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 on the land mass. So, we see there is a decrease in uh, radiation uh, uh, on the tip of South India. Now, as we move towards June, uh, most of the uh, India is now uh, under the influence of uh, monsoon and we see significant reduction in GHI values uh, except at certain locations in the uh, northwestern India where the radiation values are still uh, very high. And then again uh, moving towards August, uh, in August we have entire India uh, engulfed in uh, monsoon clouds. So, the radiation values have significantly reduced and in October, uh, uh, October basically we have a combination of uh, uh, winter approaching as well as uh, the some cloud activity. So, especially we have cloud activity which is uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the western coast of sorry eastern coast of India due to retreating monsoon and we see a reduction in uh, GHI values here. So, here uh, in this lecture uh, we discuss some basics of uh, solar radiation and how the solar radiation is affected by our atmosphere. And, uh, uh, the various activities like uh, clouds, aerosols and seasonal activities like monsoon, they affect solar radiation in a big way. And if we want to develop any power plant based on solar energy, we must take into account the local weather, the local factors that govern the absorption of solar energy in the atmosphere. So, thank you uh, for your uh, kind attention. Uh, in the next lecture, we will uh, study some applications of solar energy and how a power plant is basically made or designed based on the solar energy received at that location. So, thank you.